Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is poet Chad Abushanov. His debut collection, The Last Visit, was published in 2019. It was the winner of the 2018 Donald Justice Poetry Prize. His poems have appeared in the New York Times Magazine, The Believer, Best New Poets, Poetry Daily, Birmingham Poetry Review, Ecotone, Southern Poetry Review, Measure, a Journal of Formal Poetry, Shenandoah, The Hopkins Review, Unsplendid, and 32 Poems, among others. Abujanab earned his PhD in literature and creative writing at Texas Tech University. He is an assistant professor of English at Bemidji State University in Minnesota. On October 20th, 2021, Abushanab will give a virtual reading as a guest of the University of Oregon's creative writing program. Thanks, Chad, so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. So first, tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to become a poet. I've always had a fascination with words and patterns. Um, when I was in high school, I used to get through math classes like pre-cal and stuff by taking songs that I liked and replacing all the words, but keeping them in like the same, um, the same measure and like the same rhyme schemes and stuff like that. And um, I don't know, it didn't really feel like making poems at the time, but I realized that was practice and it was kind of getting me, um, getting me to the point where I did want to start making my own, uh, my own poems and things like that. So I always imagined that that's how I came to writing poems. Um, other than that, when I was in college, uh, I took a modern poetry course my freshman year. I actually kind of snuck in because I, it was it was uh, an upper level course and I was a freshman, but by not declaring my major, I was allowed to take courses out of sequence. So I managed to like slip under the radar and make it into that poem and or make it into that course. And um, it just was my first like big exposure to poetry of the 20th century. Like, um, you know, I, up through high school, we had read mostly very old poetry. And um, I think as far as I had gotten in terms of 20th century work was like the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, which was a really important poem to me when I was in high school. That was like mind blowing to me in terms of um, the imagery and uh, the rhythms and the things that I was seeing. So when I took this modern poetry course, I really got like a tour through the 20th century. And um, I don't know, I had this idea that it was just a conversation I wanted to be a part of. Um, I really wanted to start making things that could be a part of this big, you know, poetry dialogue that's taking place, like even today, you know, that's um, it's why form and tradition, I think, are so important to me in my work. So um, why don't you share with us one of your poems at this point? Yeah, absolutely. Well, since it is the season, I figure we will start with Halloween, which uh, people have pointed out to me appears on page 31 of my book and have asked if that's on purpose. And while I would love to take credit for it, it was completely unconscious. Um, I did look back at previous versions of the manuscript and found that when this poem landed on page 31, it never moved again. So there's something to be said for that. Um, but other words, it's just it's a happy coincidence. Halloween. <clears throat> For Halloween this year, I'll be a man. I'll work my hands to bloody rags and use my fists to prove which truths I understand. I'll paint my face into a mask of bruise like coming home after a barroom fight. A man should fight, my father said, and lose sometimes, no matter if he's wrong or right. I'll swallow up a pint of Cuddy Sark I'll stumble home and fumble with the light. He said, if you drink, you won't feel the marks. You'll never know the places where you've bled. For Halloween, I drink the autumn dark. I'll be a man the way my father said. On Halloween, we're closer to the dead. His teeth were crooked. His hands were red. Thanks so much for that. Let's talk a little bit about voice in your poems, or, or maybe I should say voices. Mm -hmm. Throughout the volume, there are poems like the one you just read, which are written in the first person singular, but there's poems written in the second person, poems written in the third person, poems written in the first person plural. Tell us a little bit about your understanding of, of the importance of different points of view and different voices in poetry. Well, I take a lot of my ideas about voice and multiple voices in a book from, I guess, like the Frostian tradition. Like this is something that we would see Frost do a lot of, um, you know, even, even going as far as to capture dialogue and um, things like that. 
Um, but what I really appreciated about, or what I appreciate about, you know, Frost's work and other poets who do this kind of thing is that we have the individual voices, but then they all kind of come together to form this singular narrative consciousness, right? Um, this one voice that makes up the voice of the book. Um, I think that that's a really cool thing about collections of poetry is that they put different voices in conversation with one another, you know, um, and there are so many different ways you can read it because there's the linear approach where you read each poem sequenced as they were intended to be in the book. And, you know, that conversation kind of unfolds as you make your way between the covers. Um, and then there's also like, you can just go back and look at individual poems and pick and choose what you want to read and think about how this one communicates with that one. Um, so I, I just love that there are all these different voices that we can have between the same two covers and even though they're very different from one another at times, they're all kind of speaking in the same direction. And sometimes it can begin to feel like all these voices are one voice. Yeah, that's very helpful. That's quite interesting. In, in this particular volume, if we wanna think about a kind of collective effect or voice, it's a dark one. I mean, many of the poems in the volume deal with dark subjects and dark speakers. So it's abuse, violence, suicide, murder are frequent topics in these poems. Why, why is poetry an appealing and compelling medium for rendering such topics and speakers for you? For me, I think that a lot of these topics seem to wander in the realm of disorder and chaos. And poetry is a way to put things back into order and to put things back into you know a shape. Um, so, I feel like, especially with the more formal poems, I feel like some of these, uh, some of the subject matters, which are really dark and kind of messy, um, there's a nice tension that happens between the messiness of that and the darkness of it and like the sort of highly calibrated order of the poem. Something is revealed in the tension between um, those two things. And I, I feel like, you know, after my, my first book, uh, I, it's not necessarily like I have the reputation of being a dark poet, because um, you know I do write other kinds of poems. But um, there was something that clicked in the um, in the making of this book, where suddenly I felt this strong pull between that kind of subject matter and this kind of order. And I thought, yes, this is a direction I can move in. This is a collection that I can actually try to fill out. Um, in fact, the first poem that I wrote that really drove that home for me was Halloween. Uh, I wrote that poem back in 2015, I want to say, the first draft of it back in 2015, and it was originally intended as a sonnet, actually, um, but I, uh, I wrote it back in 2015, and I suddenly saw this conversation happening between form and violence and masculinity and addiction. Um, and I realized that I had these other poems that had also kind of, you know, broached this kind of conversation. And suddenly I could see the community between them, you know, and I thought, well, now I have a grouping of poems that are sort of, you know, coming together in conversation. Now I can start working on new poems and going back and tweaking the old poems to make them even more pointed. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, I think that's really how I started to put those two things together. I saw it, I felt it in practice once I wrote like, you know, this one very formal poem that had very, very dark subject matter and realized this was, you know, something that I could work with and work towards. Would you mind reading us the second poem? Yeah, sure. See, let's try a voice from the wreck. <clears throat> I'm an accident on the south side of town, on the outskirts where the desert holds its ground against the streetlight's last defenses. I'm the fire leaping from the Chevy's frame to smite the sky and drain the cool out of the night. I'm the cell phone in someone's shaking hand, woken up by the explosion in the street the calls for help. I'm an ambulance. I'm a siren in the dark. I'm the stoplight. I'm the kid out driving drunk, vodka on his breath and bile in his throat. I'm the headlights slamming final recognition. And when you whisper names like curses in your room, I'm the smell of gasoline in bloom the blood-stained moon behind the clouds. I guzzle broken bones and busted radiators. 
coolant running thick in thirsty gutters. And if you ever manage to shut your eyes to sleep, I'll wander from the wreckage as you dream. So the this darkness that you spoke about in this community that you've created, it is a, a tone that's not uncommon among the literature of the American South. And you are uh, from the South and, and you did mo mo most of your education in the South, you're not there anymore, but um, in, do you have your se a sense of yourself as a Southern poet? Do you, do you see this as a volume uh, about the South? Is that place a key place for you? It is, it, and it's taken some time to come to terms with my like identity as a Southern poet. Um, the South is a really, really complicated place. And I think that beneath it all, there is this darkness, you know, there's this, there's this history of violence and this history of bigotry and hatred and just so much boiling beneath, you know, the, the charm of the South, which is what a lot of people think of when they think of, um, you know, they think of Charleston or Savannah and places like that, you know, um, beautiful, historic, um, you know, steeped in history, um, but they don't always consider the tone of that history. And I feel like that's the, that's the job of, of a Southern poet in the 21st century is to, you know, examine that and, and you know, look beneath the hood, so to speak. Um, it took me a while to come to terms with that because I never really felt like a Southern poet. I didn't feel like a part of the South. And part of it has to do with my, my heritage, the color of my skin, um, the way that I grew up just made me feel sort of separated from what could be considered the traditional South. Um, it took me a while to come to terms with the fact that, you know, people like me are what make the South the South, you know, and um, there's actually a, a wonderful uh, anthology of Southern poetry that my former mentor, John Poach, recently um, put out through Texas Tech Press University called Gracious, um, a, uh, an anthology of 21st century Southern poetry. Um, and he went out of his way to seek out a lot of people who he considers to be Southern transplants. We grew up in the South, and though we never, you know, uh, we didn't stay there for long into our adulthood. I left the South when I was in my, well, I guess my mid-20s. I, I was in Texas for a while, and um, that's sort of up in the air. A lot of people will say that that's not the South. Other people will say it is the South. You know, I'm, I'm not going to get involved in that argument for sure. Um, now I'm in the Midwest. That's, you know, decidedly un-South. Um, but he, he sought out a lot of people who had grown up in the South and moved to different places for various reasons. Um, a lot of people, you know, of color like myself left for, you know, uh, reasons of discrimination or just, you know, feeling uncomfortable um, in the area sometimes. Um, some of us just moved for jobs or other, uh, you know, other callings, going off to school, whatever. Um, but he, you know, put this very diverse group of, of Southern poets together who all have a really interesting take on the South and what it means to be a Southern poet and what it means particularly to be a person of, of color from the South um, who is a part of the Southern tradition of poetry. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, I, I, I consider myself a Southern poet now, but I consider myself a complicated version of that. And I think that ultimately that's what it comes down to. Being a Southern poet is a complicated role to have to play. Really interesting. Um, it's already become clear from the poems that you've read and also from the comments that you make that unlike a good number of contemporary American poets, you are a deft and de determined practitioner of poetic form. Mm -hmm. And I'm struck, and you, and you spoke about this earlier, about the tensions and, and in particular the pleasures that come from the interplay in your work between the kind of violent darkness of the content and these um, elegant and complex forms that you use. Can you say a little bit about that dynamic in your verse, this interplay between form and content? Yeah, sure. Um, first of all, like to clarify what I think of as form, um, I am of the belief that every poem has a form. Um, even the most, you know, out there, wild, free verse, you know, typographical experimentation, if that were to be repeated, you know, line for line, syllable by syllable, a hundred different times, eventually we would have to come up with a name for it, right? And then it would be a form. So it has to do with, you know, traditional received forms, um, knots forms, experimental forms, um, one time, you know, one off forms, um, everything I think is, is form in poetry. And that's, you know, one of the textures that we get access to that not every 
kind of writer gets to play with, right? Um, so like I said, I feel like poetry for me um, is very messy. Um, my thoughts are scattered. I, I have a billion different subject matters that I want to talk about all the time. Like my notebooks are just filled with fragments and drafts. And like I said, this book is very dark and concentrated in subject matter. But, you know, I write about things from movies I like to, you know, flavors of chips I ate and enjoy just anything that I can come up with to try to work into a poem I, I, I go with. Um, and so being that sort of scattered sometimes, um, the only way that I can find myself, sorry, the only way that I can find myself um, to a place of putting it all together is through thinking about it in forms, right? Um, using the patterning of the language, uh, the rhythms, the sounds to kind of give me something else to think about while I'm trying to put these things together. Um, Elliot had this really great, and you, you may know this, but he has this really great uh, metaphor about form and how um, your consciousness is this guard dog that's 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 guarding this you know this or this this beautiful new language that you want to reach and the only way to get at that is to distract the guard dog and you toss in the bone and the bone is form so while your mind is chewing over the very pragmatic issues of which sound will go here you know um how can i work this sentence into this meter you know things like that then you start unconsciously reaching down and gathering up the gold, the ideas that you didn't know were waiting, you know, the things that you weren't sure that you had to say. I think a lot of times my writing too is trying to get past what I thought I wanted to say and what I thought I needed to write um, to what actually needed to be said and what's actually going to make um, a good poem. And by focusing in on form, um, that really helps me. To connect it back to like the darker material, um, it's the same thing, that stuff, um, you know, a lot of it is like, uh, not all of my book is autobiographical. Um, much of it is, some of it's not. Um, and some of the things that I write about are, you know, personal to me and they they do have, you know, a, a somewhat traumatic effect to, to bring back up. Um, thinking through these things while also trying to, you know, fit them into the box, uh, to pick and choose and sort of allow myself to make the changes to the story and the changes to the language that are necessary to fit the form uh, or to fit the pattern or whatever it is that I'm working with really kind of helps me approach that in a way that doesn't drive me crazy, I guess. Um, I don't find myself drugged down or dragged down into the depths of, of despair when I'm, ex you know, exploring some of this stuff, because I'm thinking about it on this very, like, pragmatic, let's put things in order level. Um, so, I, you know, I feel like there is this beautiful thing that occurs when we see something that's very messy represented in this, you know, very structured way. Um, but at the same time, just for me as a writer, there's something that happens when I take my thoughts, which are oftentimes so scattered, and apply them to this uh, this highly, uh, highly formal approach that creates something that's, I don't know, for me, unexpected. And I, I suppose that's really what I'm trying to trying to get at in my poems in general is something that I just didn't know I was going to write something that's unexpected, even to myself. Yeah, that's really interesting. I love the idea of form as a kind of tool to um, enable the agency of the poem itself. Mm -hmm. That's really, really fascinating. Helpful. And that's, that's, that's an excellent way to put it. Yeah, that's exact. That truly is what's happening. Would you read us another poem? Absolutely. This is called Toward Your Understanding. You believe your father is made of stone, a tower whose strength is silence. Neither of you speak. This is not unusual. Today he walks ahead, leads you down Cranberry Lane to White Horse, where you are outside the dead man's house. Your father says he shot himself in there. A white house with a browning lawn and a single twisted up crepe myrtle. And maybe because it looks so familiar, like your own home, this does not frighten you. Your father says he shot himself in the head. He leads you to the window, grips your waist and lifts you to the darkened glass. Your reflection fades into the room, sparsely furnished, gray carpet, white walls. You see it there above the sofa, a blossom of blood, a ring fanning out to nothing. <laughs> 
in the center of the plaster, a small black hole. It seems somehow impossibly empty. When you're lowered back to the ground, you feel the neighborhood beneath your feet. Even the bone white sun is fading faster than it should. You know it will be dark soon. Can I ask you a specific question about this poem? Absolutely. So this is one of the poems, there's a number in the volume where uh, it's written in the second person. Mm -hmm. And this is not a, an, a, an extremely common way for poets to write poetry, but I'm interested in how you understand the significance of the use of the second person in this particular poem. I think that point of view in a poem, um, in particular, plays with the closeness we have to the subject matter, and not just as the writer, but the closeness you're trying to sort of elicit in the reader. Um, a first person, oftentimes we think that feels the closest you can get to subject matter because you're experiencing from the eye point of view. But I actually think that a second person can sometimes put people even closer to that situation because you're actually putting them in the pilot seat and letting these things unfold almost as if they're doing them themselves. You know, um, my idea for this poem was to make the reader feel as though they are being lifted up to that glass. You know, you are seeing these things um, to sort of, I guess, instill the importance of what it must have been like for someone that young to experience this. You know, it is almost kind of like an out of body experience in the poem. And I feel like that works nicely with the you um, in the poem as well. So yeah, I mean, I think it's it's really about how close we want to get people to the subject matter. Um, not we don't always want people that close, and I think that's why the you isn't you know as commonly used. Um, but it is a conscious decision decision that I make, you know, um, in terms of just how I want to immerse the reader. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, no. Uh, I want to talk about one of the poetic forms that you use uh, that recurs in the volume, which is the gazal. Yeah. And you have, there's six poems that have that title. First, what is that form? Tell us a little bit about that form. And then say why, why you dispersed that form six times throughout the volume. Okay. Um, the Ghazal is a Persian repeating form. Um, we have the last two words of each line the same. It's the, it's the, the word that ends the second line of the first stanza and it's a series of couplets and then we have the same end word uh, down the page. There are some other formal um, requirements to it which I don't necessarily follow um, in my version of it. Uh, one of the um, one of the requirements for example is that the poet's name is supposed to be in the final couplet. Um, I kind of play with something like that um, but not exactly. Uh, so it is, you know, a series of couplets with um, the same word ending off each of the lines in those couplets. Um, Dan Albergati, uh, who is another poet who's very interested in, in formal stuff, has an excellent set of um, bazaars about 9-11 in his book, uh, Millennium, Millennial Teeth. Yeah, uh, really, really good stuff. So it's a form that I've kind of been interested in for a while. Um, and it's also, you know, it kind of speaks to my heritage a bit. Uh, and I thought, you know, that would be something that seems very appropriate for a, a book that is sort of leaning into the autobiographical at times. Um, the poem actually, the, the six poems in the book actually started as one poem. Um, it was the last poem that I wrote of the manuscript, um, once I had pretty much finished it off, I was just finishing up a few extra drafts to see what might fit, what could you know maybe round some things out, anything that might fill in missing um, missing or empty spaces uh, or narrative jumps in the in the ordering of the manuscript. And I really I kind of got hooked on working on this one, and um, it was going to be the last poem in the book. Um, at the same time, I was thinking about whether or not I wanted section breaks or I wanted to do this as one continuous um, collection of poems. And I had always sort of leaned towards one continuous collection. Um, I was working with Jericho Brown at the time. He selected the book for the Justice Prize. And, you know, he's a wonderful guy. He spent hours and hours on the phone with me, you know, listening to my worries about the book and the ordering of it and, you know, ideas of how we might do this or does this edit sound better to you? You know, stuff like that. Um, we actually were talking about 
section breaks and stuff like that and figuring out where to put the the gazal in the book when one night i just had this idea that what if we took the six stanzas and broke it up so that there are six different pieces throughout the book and then you read them kind of as their individual poems because that's another uh, factor of the ghazal is that each stanza is supposed to be um possibly autonomous like it should be able to stand as a poem on its own so it was already designed to be like that um, and i thought that would you know it would make an interesting formal approach to the form um, it, or, or an interesting way to read it and kind of give, you know, multiple ways to read it, I thought. And it would also kind of act as um, section breaks in a sense, like it sort of breaks up the, the groups of poems as they move along. So I got on the phone with Jericho the next day. And before I could even tell him the idea, he was like, hey, I've got this idea and you're probably going to hate it. But I think that you should take your gazelle and you should break it up and have, you know, six different pieces throughout the book. And I was like, oh, I was going to say the exact same thing. It's obviously kismet. We have to do this. Like, that's just that's just the way it's going to go. So um, that's the reason that it appears the way that it appears in the book. When I do readings, um, a lot of times I'll read the poem in its entirety because I keep a uh, printed out copy of it in the back of my reader copy of my book. Um, but I really like the idea that you can take each one of these fragments and read it as its own poem and sort of, like I said, work it into the conversation of the poems around it. So um, you can look at a section of the Ghazal and say, how does it communicate with the poem that came before it? And how does it communicate with the poem that came after it? But you can also look at all the sections combined and say, you know, how is this a poem in its own right? And how does that fit into the, um, the sort of arc of the book? Uh, also, I just think that it's an interesting thing to say you can read this poem, but you have to read it on multiple pages throughout a book. Like there's something about that fragmentation and that effort that feels very appropriate for some of the subject matter um, in this volume. Excellent. Thank you so much. Really, really interesting and helpful comments about that form. Um, would you read a final poem for us? We're coming to the end of our time. Absolutely. And you know what? Why don't I read the Ghazal in its, in its original form, in its entirety? Yeah, I keep this little printed out square of it <laughs> in the back of my book for just this occasion. I joke, too, that the title is Ghazal because I was all out of creativity by the time it was uh, ready to... Um, ready to go to press. But in reality, I think I wanted to draw attention to the form and sort of make it clear that these are parts of a whole um, as you encounter them in fragments throughout the book. Ghazal. When my father left for good, we were living in the desert. I wouldn't cry for him. My eyes became a desert. We packed our clothes in garbage bags, rented filthy rooms. How many cheap motels lined the highways of the desert? I wrote him a letter once, but left it in a motel drawer. To where could I address it? The envelope said, desert. When I drink, my head fills up with sand. I cut myself, but do not bleed. I'm empty as a desert. 10 years later, I step barefoot on broken glass. I search for leftover Jack like water in the desert. My father's voice, like wind on dunes, I hear it from the bottle. Remember who you are, it says. You'll never leave this desert. Uh, thank you so much, really. Uh, it's great to hear it read uh, as one poem uh, after having read it in the volume. Um, we're just about at the end of our time, Chad, and I have one final question for you. Yeah, please. Uh, whenever I uh, have the opportunity to interview poets, I ask them, do you have any volumes of poetry or poets that you have recently read that you would recommend to our listeners and viewers? Yes, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in anticipation of a question just like this, I came up with four really good books that I would encourage anybody who's interested in contemporary American poetry to check out. Um, John Murillo's Contemporary American Poetry uh, with a K, very, very good book. Um, just, I, it's, 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 it's probably the best book of poetry I think I've read all year. Um, beyond that, Victoria Chang's Obit, so amazing. If you're interested in form, she has created an entirely new form that is not dependent on any of the things that we thought we knew about form. It's incredible. <laughs> 
Um, speaking of form, Erica Dawson's When Rap Spoke Straight to God, uh, a under the radar masterpiece. This poem is uh, definitely up there in conversation with the great American long poems. Um, it's, it's formally, it's just incredible. We move from sonnets to sestinas to ballads and we do it without ever missing a beat and without ever closing out of that poem. It is just fantastic. Um, and then finally, I had one more. Uh, ah, yes, Morris Manning's Rail Splitter. Uh, this is a book of poems that Morris has just put out through Copper Canyon Press, and they are all written in the voice of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, they are really, and you think, wow, how is that going to be a book of poems? And I tell you, it is really, really wonderful. They are funny, they're beautiful, they're heartbreaking at times. Um, just a really, really good collection of poems with a very, very interesting take on a on the thematics of a book. <laughs> well, thank you so much for those fascinating recommendations. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us and to share your poems with us. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to uh, appearing virtually at the end of the month. Great, thanks. I've been speaking with poet Chad uh, Abushanab, author of the collection, The Last Visit. Abushanab will give a virtual reading as guest of the U of O's creative writing program on October 20th, 2021. Thanks so much for watching.